How's everyone doing today? Um, um, before I jump into the message during worship, um, um, as we were as we were saying it, I just felt like I had one of the people in our church come up to me and say they felt like they had a word that um, you may feel like right now in your life you're kind of in the fog. You can't really see what's in front of you. You're trying to figure it out. And kind of what we felt like the word was um, um, just keep moving towards Jesus. Even if you can't see everything clearly, keep moving towards Jesus. So during worship, that, um, that's what we kind of felt. So one thing that we like to do here, we, we know that we believe that the Holy Spirit speaks. We don't think that the Holy Spirit is like just gone, like God is actively speaking now. And so, so, so during worship, sometimes people who are praying and interceding, they may get a word of encouragement for people. Words of encouragement should always be edifying and lifting people up. And so, um, so that was a, if that was you, I would love to pray with you at the end of the service. Um, or, or, if, or maybe that's just for you, a little nugget for you. In the fog, keep moving towards Jesus. Don't give up, okay? All right, well, let me go ahead and jump into our message. And, and kind of with that being said, I have a question for you. Have you ever doubted yourself? <laughs> like, I feel like I'm in good company when I say that, right? Have you ever doubted yourself? Now, I doubt myself. You want to know why I doubt myself at times? Because I know the me that you don't see. <laughs> I know the me you don't see. I know the voice in my head that tells me things that aren't nice all the time. I know the thing in my head that's not always uplifting me, not always positive. The thing that keeps putting me down. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Um... So I know my insecurities. I know my insecurities. I know my own critical voice, my thoughts, and the things that I know I dislike about myself. More often, for me, it's that I, sometimes I say things or do things, and I say, man, why did I say that? I wish I could take that back. And, you know, I wish I didn't do that. Have you ever had that? Like, oh, I would give anything to not have to do that. I wish I could take that back. Worst of all, though, um, I know my faults. But you want to know who knows all my faults and even more? God. God knows all my, my faults and, and even more. And that makes me wonder, to be honest. That makes me wonder. Like, I know God loves me, but why would God want to use somebody like me? Why would God want to choose someone like me to do anything? To do anything? You know, so if you ever doubted yourself, if you ever felt insecure, if you ever felt incredibly spiritually inadequate or insignificant, this message is for you today. All the rest of you, those who are confident, those who are perfectly and completely assured, for the best of the best, with the cream of the crop, those who graduated top of your class, those who were, who were uh, the quarterback on your team and head cheerleader, that, that have a bajillion TikTokers? Is that what it's called? For, for the rest of you, God can still use your life too. I promise you, you can. But just kind of what I know and what I see in the Bible, um, he specializes in using those who know, who need his help. Those who need his power in order to do his purpose. So as we continue our series about doubting God and bringing up some of those tough um, questions to the surface, we're going to talk about a doubt that comes in our, that, that everyone face, deals with, and that is facing your insecurities. Facing your insecurities. So let's invite the Holy Spirit here. Come, Holy Spirit. Be with us today. Remind us how capable you are. Remind us how good you are. And as we deal with the things that constantly put us down, help us see you, Jesus. Help us find hope in you, Jesus. God, we love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen. Amen. Now, now uh, one of the things I just don't understand about God, I think I kind of mentioned it, is why he uses people to do his will. Like, why would God use people to do his will? Especially, more specifically, why does he want to use me? Like, why does he want to use me? For everyone who doesn't know, insecurities have been a huge part of my, of my life. They've been a huge part of my life. Growing up, I struggled with my education. I didn't learn how to read until I was around 12 years old. Um, I, you know, every time I speak on stage, matter of fact, every time I speak on stage, there's this insecurity that comes out. Especially when I'm reading scripture. I, didn't, I had a really hard time 
learning how to read. I couldn't read. So even, even now, as a 31-year-old grown man, I still have times that, that I'm like, man, I hope I, I hope I can read something correctly. Um, I knew I wanted to be a pastor when I was 17 years old, but the thing that hindered me from doing that was what? Education. So I tried to get my GED, and after I failed four times, not once, and not twice, four times I failed to get my GED, I finally passed it. It took me almost four years to get my GED. I could have went back to high school. But, but that was just academics. Personally, so on a personal level, I always felt second best, like I was someone's second choice. I always felt like I needed to prove myself. Anyone, anyone ever feel that? Like you got to prove yourself to people. Like, like, like for me, a big motivation of things that I did was, I'm going to prove people wrong. And then finally it hit me one day, I don't even know who I'm trying to prove wrong. Like, no one's thinking about me that much for me to prove them wrong. Um, but, but honestly, honestly, there's times where I think if God wants something done, if he wants something done correctly, efficiently, effectively, he should find someone else who isn't me. Because <laughs> they'll probably do a better job. But maybe you can relate to that. Maybe that's how you feel. Maybe... You're thinking, will I be a good parent? Will I be good? Maybe you didn't have the best role models growing up. You're thinking, will I be a good parent? You know, may, maybe you, you took a new position at work, and you're thinking, can I be a good manager? Can I be a good leader? Can I be a good employee? You know, maybe you look at other people, and you say, man, they're so close to God. I can never be that close to God. You see some people who, um, do, um, who do insanity, and they get so fit, and they got abs. You say, I can never get Shanti Epps, Shanti Epps, Shanti Epps. I'll always be this. I'll always be that. Can God ever use my life? Now, here you go. I'm going to break this to you straight today. One of the reasons why we have insecurities is because we don't understand our value. One of the reasons why we have insecurities is because we don't understand our values. Let me rephrase this for you. Because I'm a child of the Most High God, I am valuable. Hold on, let me say that again one more time. Be be because, because social media, they like to tell you, oh, just believe in yourself. Just, you can just do it. Like, like, that's all good. Pep talks are good. That's fine. But you are valuable. Your life matters. Not because some bibbidi-bobbidi-boop fairy tale. Cinderella's a good movie, but, but because you are a child of the Most High God. And, the chi and since you are a child of the Most High God, God doesn't make invaluable things. He only makes valuable things. He only creates things worth the value. Jesus says it like this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does a thief steal? A thief steals what is valuable. What is valuable. So what, so, so what, so why does the thief, why does the enemy try to attack you, beat you, kill you, destroy you? It's because you are valuable to God. It's because you're valuable to God. Like any parent, any parent or anyone that has a loved one, you know, one of the worst things that someone can do to you is hurt your kid or hurt someone you love. See, the enemy wants to hurt God. So what does he do? He attacks what he loves which is you. He attacks his creation. And I want to remind you of what the Apostle Paul says about you. Ephesians 2.10 says this, we are God's masterpiece. Come on. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So, so, so who are you to God? You're God's masterpiece. You're God's workmanship. You're created for good works that he planned for you. So even this word masterpiece um, me means a creation, uh, destina d d design, destinated, no, nope. destined, no, nope. D-E-S-I-G, designated, yes. Creation with a designated purpose, a workmanship, a masterpiece. See, this is where we actually get the word poetry. Did you know you're God's poem to the world? You're his poetry to the world. That means you're valuable. You're beautiful. 
you are custom fit for what God created you to do, and he created you with a purpose. This, this is something I want you to know. You were born at the right time to do the right thing that God destined for you to do. He created in advance for you. You're his masterpiece. So when? When the devil tells you, God can't use you, look at your mess. Look at what you've done. Look at all the things you messed up. You got to get good at shouting back and saying, yeah, I may have made some mistakes, but I'm God's masterpiece. Yeah, I don't have it all together, but I'm God's workmanship. And he created me for good works, even when my bad works try to get in the way. His grace gives me the ability to move forward. See, see, I want you to know today that you are God's masterpiece. And since you are God's masterpiece, no matter what the world throws against you, he created you for a purpose. So here's the question. Who does God most often use? Who does God most often use? What kind of people does God use? So when we look at Scripture, there's three I want to highlight of people that God regularly chooses. And the number one is this. God uses the unlikely. God uses the unlikely people. So here you go. We're going to jump into some Scripture. Now, you, you may remember that God told the prophet Samuel to appoint the next king of Israel. King Saul was messing up. He was messing up. He was going nuts. And God is like, we got to get this guy up out of here. <laughs> okay, so, so he tells Samuel, I want you to, to anoint the new king. And so Samuel arrives at the house of Jesse because that's where the Lord, Lord told him to go. Check this out. First Samuel 16 says this. When they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and said, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. I want you to get this. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height because he looks like Matthew McConaughey. For I have rejected him. The Lord, get this, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. <sighs> Don't you know we live in a world that if you make a mistake, they're ready to give you the boot? We live in a world that if you, if you mess up, you got baggage, you got problems, you got issues. I would say, we got to cancel these people. Thank God that we serve a God that does not look at things the way people look at things. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. I love this. God is looking for the qualities people often overlook. So Samuel goes by looking at all the qualified candidates. He had a whole bunch of, Jesse had a whole bunch of sons. And, 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 he keeps, and Jesse lined them all up. And he said, nope, not this one. Not this one. Not this one. Definitely not that one. You know, not this one. Not this one. And then Samuel's kind of like, hey, man. Bring him in. And so Jesse goes and grabs his youngest son. And, and David, as we know, who eventually become King David, David shows up to the scene. He's the least likely. And God says, that's the one I choose. That's the one I choose. He calls him and he chooses him. See, God loves to use those who are, of, who are overlooked by others. God loves to use those who are overlooked by others. See, a few weeks ago, we had our serve day. That was awesome. Who came out to serve day? You guys did a great job. People were like, I did. I did. Okay, so we did our serve day. And now when, now when the school told us we ended up doing a serve day right here, we, we wanted to bless the school that we get to meet in every week. And so the school asked us if we could fix their courtyard area, um, and primarily because they're actually going to start using it to help special education and stuff like that. So really, really cool what they want to do with it. But when, but when Charlotte, who runs our acts of kindness ministry, told me that, I was like, eee. Dang, they want us to landscape. I was like, like, I don't know how to do that stuff, man. I was like, man, I was like, okay, we'll make this happen. And so, so I didn't know a lot about landscaping, so I'm hoping maybe there's some people in our church who do. And guess what? People showed up.
We had a couple of kids who were chopping things. and like, look at me, chop at things. I'm like, whoa, be careful. Don't come by me. Um, you know, we, we had all this awesome stuff. We had Lori was there. She, she had her sweet tea looking like Martha Stewart, give, giving everyone fresh sweet tea, making sure everyone was hydrated. You know, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And, he, and here you go. Let me speak. Let me speak to this real fast. The world tries to tell us, oh, you got to do something so grand, grand, grand. You got to do this, that, and the third. Oh, you, you got to measure up to this people. You got to measure up to that church. You got to do, you want to know what we were? We were just a small group of people taking what we had and, make, and making a difference. See, I want you to know the enemy would love to say, oh, you're too small. Oh, you don't have what it takes. Oh, you're not like those people. You're not like those people that take the right picture angle on social media, even though their life actually sucks. They just take good pictures. You're not like those people. You can't do anything. And I'm telling you, the Lord wants you to know he specializes in using the unlikely to accomplish the impossible task. Come on, God specializes in using the unlikely to accomplish the impossible task. If you ever felt overlooked, good news, God can still use you. God can still use you. Second thing is this, God uses the insecure. God uses the insecure people. Now, you may remember in the book of Judges, after the Israelites have sinned, which they did very often, um, God turned them over to the hands of the Midianites, and, and there was this guy named Gideon who was very insecure. He was afraid, and he was hiding. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. That sounds good. Like, like I would like that. You know, that sounds good to me if I was kind of struggling with some stuff. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, You're a mighty morphin power ranger. Does anyone remember that? The original? The original one? That's the best one. And they got, it got weird, but the original one was the best. You know, and, and, you know if the Lord appeared to me and said, and said, hey, you aren't Kevin Hart, you're Dwayne Johnson. I'd be like, yeah, like I am. You know, you know that, would, that would be great to me. You know, you know but, but, but this is what happens. Gideon gets his word. The angel showed up to him, said, hey, man, you're a mighty morphing power ranger. And what did Gideon do? Did Gideon say, yes, I'm a mighty warrior. Yes, I'm going to accomplish what God wants me to do. Nope. An angel. Look at this. An angel. Not like just some dude down the street. Hey, man, you're a good guy. Dr. Phil didn't show up. You're good, dude. No, an angel showed up and said, dude, you're a mighty warrior. You got this. And Gideon's response to that was, you want to know what Gideon's response to that was? He said, where is it? He said, how am I to rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest and I'm the least. I'm the wrong guy. I'm the wrong guy. You got the wrong person. Now, this is what it says to me. In fact, this happens to us very often. Most of the time in our lives, our insecurities shout louder than God's affirmation. Our insecurities shout louder than God's affirmations for us. And how many of us felt, in, felt our own insecurities shout louder than the thing that God is calling us to do? How many of us have had doubts that shout louder than God's promises? You'll never, you'll always, you won't, you can't. And one thing I love about my son, Jameson, I love a lot about him. But one thing I love about my son, Jameson, is that he knows if he wants to get somewhere, if he wants to do something, he has to get the attention of his father. See, Jameson, he would live outside if he could, literally. He loves nature. He loves slides. He loves dirt. He loves cars. He loves cozy coop. He loves them all. And often what Jameson does when he wants to go outside and he knows he's not able to go outside by himself, he runs up to me, he lifts up his little arms and says, Beep, bop, bop, bop. which translates to pick me up. And then, and then I pick him up and then he does this thing. He, does, he hits me on the chest and points. I'm like, I'm like, boy, what are you hitting me for? He hits me on the chest and he points. You see, here you go. How do you overcome your insecurities? Come on. How do you overcome your insecurities? You want to know how you overcome your insecurities, church? And I'm going to sound like a broken record when I say this. How do you overcome your insecurities? By spending intentional daily time with God. By spending intentional daily time with God. You can hear me preach some blue in the face, and I can have some good messages, but until you spend time with God by yourself, 
Until you know the voice of God. Not my voice, not, not TikTok 30 second clip of Stephen Furtick's voice. It's good and encouraging. But until you know God's voice, you will stay stuck in your insecurity, stay stuck in your doubt, because the more you don't know, the, the more you don't understand God's voice, the more you don't understand that you're a child of the Most High God. But the more you understand God's voice, the more you spend time with God, you see that, oh, I have the benefits that my Father gives me. Come on, somebody. Come on, someone. See, when you spend time with the Father, you'll understand you're his daughter or son. See, guys, I'm going to be honest with you today. Can I be honest today? I like to be honest. If I can't be honest, I guess I'll go to a bar or something. But I like to be honest with you guys. See, see, I still feel insecure. Often. Regularly. Doing this church has made me feel more insecure. I, I went to a motion conference the other day at a church down the street, and they had all these young people. They all these youth. I, I was a youth pastor for a long time, and I said, "Dang, why did I get out of this game? <laughs> I should just be a youth pastor, you know, you know." But but you know what? More. But here you go. The more and more I grow in my relationship with Jesus, the more and more I realize when I'm in the arms of my heavenly Father, I can go places I can't go by myself. Let me say that one more time. When I'm in the arms of my heavenly Father, I can go places that I can't go by myself. I can stand up for things that I couldn't stand up for by myself. I can believe for things that I can't believe by myself. I have hope for the future, even though I can't predict the outcomes. But I only get that revelation when I spend daily time with God. Gideon was insecure. He said, I'm the, it's the weakest tribe, and I'm the least of the weakest one. And you see, for some of you today, God is going to call you. He's going to stir you. He's going to stir something inside of you. He's going to move you to actually do something. And you say, Jacob, well, what's that? Did you guys know what I've been praying for? I've been praying for a drummer. Do, 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 boom. Seriously. And I've been praying that God will give us worship people on our, on our stage. Not just so we can have a cool band, but we know good music draws people to the Lord. And so that's something that I've been praying for. Did you know if you have a musical gift and you haven't been using it for the Lord, God's ready for you to use it? If you love kids, come on. Even if you kind of like them. We got a lot of kids back there. My, my sister-in-law, Renee, has six kids. That's a lot of kids. You want to know what she did the other, other week? She said, I know I'm around kids all day, but I see that there's a need. Sign me up. Put me in kids' church. Because you want to know what? When people are moved by God, they see a need and say, put me in, coach. Put me in. And friends, I know God wants to stir something in you. God wants to do something in your life. Maybe in your marriage, you've been putting off marriage counseling. Whew. Yep. Whew. Maybe you've been ready to throw in the towel on that marriage, and God says, I'm not done with this. I'm not done with this yet. Maybe you're a parent, and you're struggling. How do you work with your kids? How do you? God said, Lean into me. I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you. How, was, how is God going to show you how to love your kids? When you embrace them as a heavenly father. And you begin to father, mother your kids the way God loves you. Come on. Come on. That's off, my, that's off my notes a little bit. That's off my notes. I just felt like that was for someone. See, I remember a time in my life. James, you can make it spiritual up here for us. Um, I remember a time in my life when I was really trying to figure out my purpose. It was yesterday. I'm joking. It wasn't yesterday. It wasn't yesterday. Um, but I remember a time in life when I was trying to figure out my purpose in life. I was in my early 20s. And, and to be honest, I had a really bad addiction to pornography. And it almost derailed my entire life, to be honest. And it actually even led me in, in, to have this horrible relationship with a girl who, I, who had, yeah, it was bad. And, um, and I remember at being at this crossroads in my life. And I was working at a pawn shop, believe it or not. <laughs> I was working at a pawn shop in Portsmouth, Virginia. Have you ever been to Portsmouth, Virginia? It's the dirty, dirty. And um, I was working at a pawn shop there, and I just stepped down from my job as a youth director, and I was wrestling with doubts and insecurities. Made a lot of bad decisions. 
And I was told by a pastor at our church who wasn't there for long. He said, because of what you did, Jacob, God could never use someone like you. He told me that I disqualified myself to ever be used by God again because of the mistakes that I made. And next week I am talking about, next week our message is called, When Christians Hurt You. I think a lot of us have been hurt by Christians. So you don't want to miss that week. And if you know someone who has left the church, the suspect of the church because of Christians, invite them to church next week. I think it's going to be good, okay? But anyways, so I'm at this crossroads of my life, and in my head, God can't or won't use me, that I messed up too much. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do with my life because at that point, being a pastor was the only thing I wanted to do. So I'm in counseling for the sexual addiction that I have, and it's very intense. I mean, so intense working through how pornography has such a hold over my life. And even as we just read the story of Gideon, I can relate to Gideon. I've heard God before. I know God spoke to me before. I felt his presence before. But I remember in that season in my life, I felt like I was from the least group of people, and I was the weakest of them. So here you go. There's this one particular day that my boss at the pawn shop sent me to pick up lunch for, for, for everyone in the shop. So I'm at this KFC parking lot. Come on, extra crispy. About to walk in, and then this homeless man comes up to me, walks up to me, and asks me for money. And I tell him, I tell him, yeah, I don't have any money, but I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you lunch. So I go in, I order for the shop, get something for the guy. I walk, I walk back out, and I go up to this homeless man, and I, and I hand him his food. And in that moment, in that moment, I felt what we would call a nudge of the Holy Spirit. I felt a nudge of the Holy Spirit. Now, you got to remember, let me ask this. I had this pastor that told me God will never want to use me again. That I was disqualified to be used by God, as if I can qualify myself to ever be used by God. I was disqualified. So I'm thinking to myself, I can't do this. That's not, that must, that must be my stomach rumbling because I want some chicken. Like this, not, this can't be God. I have self-doubt. I have insecurities. And, but then I say, come on, kind of hesitantly, hey, man, can I pray for you? And the homeless man is like, uh, yeah, sure. And right there, I start to pray for him in a KFC parking lot. And, and, and I just want to add to that real fast. Did you know that God can use your life just not in this building, but wherever you are? Did you know, I actually think God prefers to use people not in this building, but out there somewhere. I think God prefers to use you at your workplace, in your home, in your doubt, in your fear, in your insecurity, when you feel like you don't have the safety and the comfiness of your church to to lean into. I think that's when God actually wants to use you the most. And so I'm in this KFC parking lot, and I feel this nudge of the Holy Spirit. I haven't felt God's presence at this point in a long time. I asked this man, can I pray for you? He's like, oh, sure. I put my hand on him. I said, can I put my hand on you? And he says, oh, sure. And I put my hand on him, and I begin to pray. And I'm not going to lie to you guys. As close, as close as ever before in my life, I heard the audible voice of God. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just really clear in my heart. But, but it was so clear that I thought someone was behind me. And I felt the Lord say to this man, go make it right with your family. And so I'm hit. I'm literally like hit. I'm like, whoa. And I look at this man very hesitantly. I stop praying. And I said, hey, man, I feel like God's saying you need to go make it right with your family right now. And check this out. I wish the story went like, and the man broke down in tears, and I prayed for him and led him to the Lord, and he got into a Bible study. He became a great tither and all that stuff. That, it didn't go that way. I told him that, and this man looked at me like I was Dumbledore or something. Like, 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 like yo, how do you know this magic power, man? Like, like, like he looked, he was like afraid. He was scared. And, and, and I ended up praying for this guy, and, 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 and he walked off. But this is what I want you to know. The atmosphere changed. The atmosphere changed. And this homeless man, he looked at me with a terrified face. But I knew, I don't know if I scared that man. Maybe I did. But I know God used me that day to speak directly to that man's heart. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. After that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit in a new way. I continued my counseling, and I've been freed from porn for over 10 years now. 
I instantly got back involved with my church in Virginia Beach. I started serving again, and, and then I went on to, with, along with my wife Erin, ended up building one of the biggest youth ministries in Virginia Beach at that time. And, and, and the rest is history, as they say. But God, here you go. But God used me. When did he use me? When did he use me? He used me in my insecurity. He used me in my doubt. He used me when I had a belief about myself that someone else spoke over me that didn't match up with what God said about me. And I'm going to tell you this, friends. You may have a belief about yourself that doesn't match up with what God says about you. And I'm going to tell you, when you make room for God, when you spend time with God, the Holy Spirit will hit you and you will begin to do works that you never thought, dreamed, or imagined that you can do. Because in the most cheesy way I can say, God does not use the qualified. He qualifies the available. Will you make yourself available? Because you're making yourself available to something. You are available to something, but is what you're available to making a difference in this world? Is it helping people? See, guys, oh, I love this. This was a good point. Here you go. You want to know why you have adversity in your life? One, because you're not spending daily time with the Lord, but you still will even when you do. What happens is this. Whenever God calls you, the devil's going to try to stop you. See, one of the greatest tools that the enemy uses is to attack your self-worth. He's going to tell you, who do you think you are? You're not ready. You don't belong here. You're not good enough. And you want to know the point I got in my life, guys, when I feel like the enemy is accusing me of I'm not good enough, you're not good enough. I, I kind of feel like I say right back to him, yeah, you're right. I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified. I have messed up. But God wants to use me anyways. <laughs> but God wants to use, like, it's not about me getting it all right. It's about me taking one obedient step towards Jesus today. See, see, you're never going to get it all right. But today you can say, I will take one step at a time towards Jesus. Let's go back to our story last week. Aaron did a great job talking about Peter. And Peter, Peter, he's on the water. He's walking on the water. And, and, and God called, Jesus calls them to walk on the water. A couple things I want to point out. A couple things I want to point out. There's 11 other dudes in that boat who are scared to death. They're scared to death. No, Peter, don't go. Peter, stay in the boat. Peter, that's a ghost. It's Casper. You know, don't go out. You're, we're hallucinating. You know, you know there's, there's, uh, there's 11 other dudes in there who are freaking out. They're having a hard time. And then here's Jesus strolling on the water like he does. Like he's like taking a nice little power walk on the water. And, and, and Peter, says, Peter says, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come and I'll come. And Jesus says, all right, come out. Notice Jesus didn't have a three-point message. Jesus didn't give him the three tips on how you can walk on the water. Don't get me going today, guys. He didn't give him the three steps on how to live a, a life that walks on the water. He said, yeah, just come. Just come. Just come. You want me? Come. But the winds and the waves. There's always going to be winds and waves, guys. <laughs> you always have winds and waves in your life? There's always going to be winds and waves in your life. There's going to be winds and waves that try to make you doubt, that try to make you afraid, try to tell you that you can't, you won't, and you'll never. But Jesus' message to you is so simple. Just come. Just come to me. Just come and walk towards me. Hey, and when you fall, not if, when you fall, guess what? I'll scoop you up. And here's the best part of this story that no one talks about. How did Peter get back in that boat? He was walking with Jesus. You want to know how you can best experience Jesus? Sometimes you fall. Sometimes you fail. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure just means you're trying. Just come. I'll pick you up. God will use your life in an amazing way. 
So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you say, come. On the water, in the waves, in the storm. Oh, I just feel very clearly Jesus is saying, I'm not going to clear up the weather of your life before you come to me. Feel the Holy Spirit saying, yep, you may be walking in the storm. That's okay. Come. Just come. And I feel the Holy Spirit saying, be cautious of the voices telling you to stay in the boat. Even good-hearted people can misguide you. But come to Jesus. Walk to Jesus. He uses the unlikely. He uses the insecure. And God will even use those who fail. And he says, come. I'll pick you up. So Jesus, we come to you today. Failures and all. Insecurities and all. When we feel unlikely, unable, or incapable, we know that you are more than capable. What's impossible for man is possible for you, God. So, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that even in our doubt, we can come to you. We can come to you. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know this Jesus I'm talking about. or Maybe you have, but life got in the way. You want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your heart. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out, have you come up front, nothing like that. Just right where you are, if you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, I just want to pray for you. Mm, if that's you, just say this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, thank you. Forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. Today, I trust you with my life. Today, I come to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.